How about them Cowboys? I don't think we'll be hearing that line coming from Jimmy Johnson anytime soon, Mike. The team, the owner, the coach, the end. We have mutually decided that I would no longer be the head football coach with the Dallas Cowboys. Jimmy was looking for an exit door. Just when they reached the pinnacle, people just had a hard time understanding why does this have to end? We were all disappointed. We were all sad to see him go because he was a great coach and uh, he was our leader. And it was stunning for me that he would, he would walk away from a team that was fully loaded and ready to, to, to march on and win and, and three-peat here. So it, it, was, it was frustrating for me. I didn't think it was fair. We'd always talked about team. We always talked about when, uh, when we start winning championships, there's going to be enough, uh, enough success to go around for everybody. And then the people who were telling us that couldn't find a way to balance it out between the two of them. And, uh, you know, the group of guys missed out on an opportunity to try and make history. I feel very strongly that we've got one of the most talented teams that there is in the NFL today, if not the most talented team and one of the best that has ever been put together. I feel very confident that the continuity can be kept in place and be motivated with the new head coach of the Dallas Cowboys, Barry Switzer. Let me introduce you to it, Barry. Thank you, Jerry. The uh, energy and the electricity packed into that room that morning. day, it was, it was very tense. It was also uh, very emotional. Uh, and then and then about halfway through it, um, Barry interjected some humor into it, and I don't know that Jerry was ready for it. I hope I can do as good a job as Jimmy Johnson. That's what you're hoping, and that's damn sure what you're hoping. <laughs> that's why I'm here. <laughs> well, I'm tan, rested, and ready. You know, that's all I can say to you. I'm ready to go. I want to start tomorrow. Nothing's going to change, Cowboy fans. Get ready to watch the Dallas Cowboys be the best in the NFL. We've got a job to do, and we're going to do it. Baby! <laughs> I think Jerry uh, wanted to prove that uh, that it wasn't all Jimmy's doing. I think he felt that uh, he could bring anybody in, and with the talent that we already had, he could just plug someone in, and we'd go on to win that 94 season. Well, Coach, welcome to your new home. Thank you. It's good to be here, Jerry, and thank you for that opportunity. So this is going to be the most exciting, this is going to be the most challenging we'll uh, camp that uh, we've ever been a part of. Uh, and not just because uh, Barry Switzer's coaching the Cowboys instead of Jimmy Johnson, uh, but also uh, because we are in pursuit of a third straight Super Bowl. I think Barry walked into the biggest no-win situation that any coach has in the history of the National Football League. He walked in with enthusiasm, and he walked in eager to go. Yeah, I, this, is, this is what I look forward to. Really, it's, it's not... Uh, yeah, you know, all the attention and all that's not important to me. Uh, what you, uh, you know, it's being able but I don't know that he knew the full depth of what a trap it really was. Uh, because if he won, he won with the players that were there that Jimmy had coached to this level. And if he didn't win to any level other than the Super Bowl, it was a failure. Jimmy had the last say in things. And I don't know if Barry had the last say on that field as far as how the team operated. He was so hands off, he allowed the, the coordinators to basically run practice. If there's a problem, he allowed them to make the adjustments with it. I think Barry Switzer was smart and he respected his staff and his players enough not to lie to them. To say that I'm in control, I'm making all the decisions. It's me, 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 me. He respected us enough not to say that. He realized that Mr. Jones was now moving and getting deeply involved in the organizations in every aspect of it, from talent uh, to free agency to, to coaching, and that Mr. Jones ultimately would be making those decisions. The atmosphere just wasn't the same. And uh, I don't know, maybe that was uh, one of the reasons that we started to lose our edge, because there wasn't that, that threat there. I am ready today. I'm finally getting around to do what I want to do, and I'll be glad to get rid of you guys where I can go do it and say I'm going to do one interview a day, and that's it, and let me go coach. Let me go do what I want to do. He was always very open. Um, you know, there were some bizarre things that you'd see on TV, though, during the course of our season when he'd, uh, when he'd be on camera. They played with a lot of emotion today. <laughs> they got after it. They spilled their bucket out there. I hope they didn't lose all of it. They were ready to go. It's not hard. It's not hard to be a football coach, especially when you've done it for 30 years. It's overrated. I mean, you, people, you people make the geniuses and the grooves and the myths out there. You all make them out to be more than what they are. And then when 
You know, <laughs> it's your fault for doing it. Then when they begin to believe it, then it's their fault, right? No, I never said, nor is anybody saying, that an assistant coach has a problem with Barry Switzer. What I'm saying, and what a lot of players are saying, and what a lot of coaches are saying, that assistant coaches are having problems with assistant coaches, and players want you to step up and stop I think, I think you don't know what you're talking about, and they don't either, Dale Hanson. There is no problem here on this staff in the Dallas Cowboys. I promise you that. Barry, again, had the philosophy, they're either for you or against you, and it's not worth trying to kiss their butt because... They can't help you and they can't fire you. In 94, we were very, very good, but there wasn't that level of invincibility. How about them Cowboys? We are going to treat Pete. We are going to make history. We still had such a talented, uh, poised team that was made up of veterans in their prime that we could go out on form and, for the most part, uh, handle anybody that uh, we had to come up against. Barry Switzer had not coached for five years, but his many critics were silenced when the 94 Cowboys marched to a 12 and four record and into the NFC Championship. Deep ball to the middle, here's Harper at the 45, he caught it. Left to the 40 of the Packers, down the sideline to the 20. An inside move to the 10, he broke away, he scored, he scored! They've been waiting all year long to go play the 49ers in the championship game. It's exactly what everybody said would happen, and now it's going to happen. Nothing was going to be measured in terms of success in 94 as to whether we won 13 or 14 regular season games in the NFC championship game. It was going to be, did you beat the 49ers, and did you win the Super Bowl? It was, that, was, that was success, and everything else was bust. My mindset going into that game and our mindset as a team was going in saying we had San Francisco's number. We felt if we went out and played our best game and they played their best game, we'd beat them. But we didn't do that. Back to throw again is Aikman. Some pressure. Gets the pass away. Eric Davis picks it off. He's got a lane down the left side. 20, 10, 5. Touchdown, 49ers. The game was won in the first eight minutes of the game. Back to throw is Aikman. Has time. Sends it down the left side. Ball is caught and knocked down. That could be a fumble. Yes, it is a fumble. 49. 21 to 0 deficit with eight minutes gone in the game. They give it to Floyd. He gets in easy, standing up. Washington grabs him. It's too late. 49ers, after seven and a half minutes of this game, lead 20 to nothing. The 38 to 28 defeat left the Cowboys devastated. Well, if there was a honeymoon, or some semblance of a honeymoon for Barry Switzer, uh, it ended that day out in Candlestick Park. The mood was complete and total shock. And I think everyone who was with that team from 89 or 90 onward uh, shared that feeling. Couldn't believe we lost, didn't want to get on the plane, didn't want to do anything because you knew tomorrow morning you're going to have to get up, go out to the front yard and pick up the paper. And it was going to say, Cowboys drop NFC Championship game. Not only Barry and not only Jerry uh, was going to be judged on whether the season was successful or not by winning the Super Bowl, period. And... Uh, and, and when that didn't happen, um, there, was, there, was just the short, there was a very short list of people to blame, and it started with the two guys at the top. While skeptics predicted a quick end to the Jones-Switzer union, the team rallied around their embattled head coach. I think he related very well to players. He loved football players. He loved to talk to them. He loved to know more about them, he loved to know about their families. He'd ask me about my wife and kids, and... Uh, you know, that's the type of person he was. he was. He was more of a player's coach. He wanted to know how you're doing outside of football. And uh, a lot of black players gravitated to him because he was open. Black players loved him in the past, and, and uh, the black players in the locker room loved him also. Red ball, red ball, twins, twins. 1995 began with many questions. Had the talent level slipped? Would free spirits and free agency sink this impending dynasty? Dog it. Let's go. We started losing guys that were uh, you know, parts of that, of that, that engine that we, we had built over those, uh, those seasons that uh, you couldn't replace them. Free agency decimated Dallas. Lost were center Mark Stepnoski and high wire receiver Alvin Harper. 
let's live with giving him the final offer, and then if he doesn't, then we'll all That's live with it and then go get the other guy. Is that where we went? The owner was also the general manager. This two-headed monster was roasted by the media, which enraged Jerry Jones. Meddling. I will tell you right now, if you have worked as hard as I have to get where I've got, and somebody says you're meddling in what you've done, that will make you a little defensive and turn you into something you don't like yourself. And I'm tired of defending that. The facts are that's not been the way it's been out here since 1989. It's not going to be the way it is going forward. It has helped us win since 1989, and it's going to help us win again. Just keep on going. You motivate me. Shift. Red 18. Red 18. Two mediocre drafts produced rookies that even the veterans questioned. We got these young guys we drafted. They were great players. And come in. And, and, and everybody's, not, you know, you don't hit on every one of them. But, I mean, he, he pumps up every single guy. How you doing? All right. Good. Bad omens turned ominous when all-pro offensive tackle Eric Williams shattered his knee in a car accident. Eric Williams was one of the meanest guys I've ever been associated with on a football field. And uh, I was happy to have him on our team. And he was never the same after his car accident. There were more critics than champions of the Cowboys. This team seemed like a house of cards. But in a game of Texas Hold'em, the Cowboys still had a few aces up their sleeves. Let's go, team. The Cowboys opened the 95 season explosively on the game's second play. The handoff goes to Emmitt Smith, his first run, 45-50. He's going to score. Touchdown, Cowboys. A 60-yard ramble by Emmitt Smith. Is he back? I would say so. This is going to be a great year. You know, look at that. You know, second play of the game. They give us something we've never seen. We pick it up. Everybody gets a hat on a hat, and he goes untouched 60 yards. You know, you had a real good feeling about what that season was going to become uh, just off of that game and especially that play. kind of got the feeling that that game was one of those they're back type situations and uh, whether whether the country liked it or not all these you know big star Dallas Cowboys guys are, are, are back in our face again on national television and it looks like they might be pretty good again on Monday night Dallas lost their all pro cornerback for the season if Kevin Smith is out for any length of time how much more important would that make the signing of one Deion Sanders to the Dallas Cowboys? I don't care what it takes. You get me Deion. Deion. Are you ready? I was born ready. Run, cowboy. Men like that, I could rule the world. The Cowboys' quest to recapture their kingdom depended on signing the crown prince of cornerbacks. Deion Sanders' coverage of Michael Irvin was a big reason the 49ers won the 94 NFC Championship. Locked in a contract battle with San Francisco, Primetime was a free agent playing baseball with the Yankees. The Cowboys plucked this plum like low-hanging fruit. There was a huge rivalry between us and the 49ers, so why not? You know, you need a corner. We just lost, you know, our number one corner, so why don't we take the one that was with the team that beat us last year in the championship game and won the Super Bowl? In Jerry's mind, I think he felt that the only way we get back to the Super Bowl is that we take Deion Sanders away from San Francisco and put him on our team. In Jerry's mind, he viewed Dion as a crown jewel, and if he could make it work financially, he wanted to do it. He and his son, Stephen, almost came to blows one night during the negotiation because Stephen was concerned about the salary structure of the club. Who else comes on TV but Jerry? Jerry said Dion. If Bringing got, him in was not just adding the best cornerback in football, but it was adding another first-name superstar 
to an organization that people said, geez, haven't, don't they have enough? He was a funny guy. He once said to me, Rich, I don't love the camera. The camera loves me. I don't love money. Money loves me. So what's it going to be, Dion? Football or baseball? Both, boss. Both? Both. Offense or defense? Both. Both? Both. 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 Pizza Hut. Meat lovers or stuffed crust pizza? Both. 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 So what would it be, Dion? 15, 20 million? Both. Without Dion, who was injured, the Cowboys won four straight games, including an overtime thriller in Minnesota. And off to Emmett Smith. Left tackle running with 30. He may score to the 20, to the 10, to the 5. Touchdown, Dallas. This game is over. The Cowboys have won it. The Cowboys finally lost in Week 5 to the lowly Washington Redskins. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. The Redskins have done it. Upset the Cowboys at RFK. Troy Aikman was accused of playing soft against his former coordinator, Norv Turner. We, we heard the stories about, you know, Troy going easy on Norv, which was, you know, BS. I'm sure it was just the opposite. Troy wanted to prove to Norv that I can beat you without you. Troy is, is all about winning. And I don't care if, if his mom was the head coach and his dad was the offensive coordinator on the other side. He, he's going to want to beat him. So it didn't matter that Norv was over there. The last thing Troy's going to do is do anything to lose a game, purposely to lose a game. We invented the conspiracy theory in Dallas. I mean, that's what we're known for. When there would be a rumbling that Troy didn't perform at his highest level when he was playing against Norv, people in the locker room just rolled their eyes and said, that's garbage, that's ridiculous, that's baloney. It was just part of the myth and uh, madness of, of what being around that era of America's team was all about. The seven and one Cowboys came to Atlanta, where Deion Sanders made his long awaited debut against the team that originally drafted him. This is our house, this ain't Cowboys. This is Atlanta. Come in here, that's right, Deion Who? What better time for him to come back than against the club that originally drafted him back in 1989? So, um, you know, you can't script some of the things that, that were revolving around that franchise for a while. Had a little bit of a show business uh, movie premiere type setting uh, for Dion coming back to the Georgia Dome and playing his first game as a Dallas Cowboy. The glitzy atmosphere turned into the golden gloves for primetime. The only neon in Dion's debut was on the final scoreboard. Here's a deep drop for Aikman. First 10, pump fake, going way down the field for Michael Irvin, bumping and grinding at the ball. Oh, he's got it. It's the ball. Touchdown, Cowboys. There was blood in the water when the red and gold came to Texas Stadium. This was heavyweight championship fight type stuff. There was a real sense of this is gonna be a big game and this is gonna be a great game. And it was in November and we had the best record in the NFC. And this was our opportunity to reestablish, tip the scale back over to the Dallas side, reestablish the Cowboys dominance in the NFC. Don't forget what happened last year. It had some of that Ali Frazier type atmosphere for a football game and it wound up being George Foreman and Joe Frazier. I mean, they knocked us out right out of the box and it was deja vu all over again. He's off and running into the 40. They can't catch him. He'll beat them all. Touchdown, 40 We thought we'd line Dion up on Jerry and the other corner go opposite the whole game, but they didn't do that. They moved Jerry around. They got him on linebackers. They created matchups of what they wanted to see there. And we really wasn't prepared for that. And it was hard to adjust. We were all over the place. We were playing, trying to play man to man. And Larry Brown was playing in a position where I was supposed to be playing a safety position. Rice has lined up on Larry Brown. Rice ate Larry Brown alive in both games last year. Larry Brown had no idea what he was supposed to be doing in safety position. So that's how crazy it was. You could just feel all the air going out of Texas Stadium and up through the hole in the roof. It was really that devastating because of what had happened the previous January. This one was actually worse than the championship game. We, we never even got close. 
quick slant in. Ball is caught and fumble. 49ers pick it up. Bring it back as Hanks. He's going to go. He'll go in. Touchdown 49ers again. Unbelievable. Are we in San Francisco again? Have we not now? seen this before? Flashbacks from last year. So the psyche had changed. It, it went from us dominating them to them dominating us. I think we just pretty much, you know, we got out coached that game. That was a point in the season where you started to think the Cowboys aren't what the Cowboys were. And uh, and maybe maybe the, the pendulum of uh, power has completely shifted to the to the Bay Area. That San Francisco game was the first time in a long time that any of us ever felt that. They're, they're just better than we are right now. The devastating 49ers loss was compounded when tackle Leon Lett was suspended by the NFL for substance abuse. We needed Leon Lett to, to, to anchor down that defensive line to, to get to where we needed to be. And for him to already have a problem, got help, and then to basically do it all over again, I thought he let down the team at the time. But at the same time, I was concerned about who Leon was. And he was with a group that some of the guys had already been in trouble. So uh, it's going to take a very strong person to be able to decline uh, some of the things that were, were going on at that point. If there was a party going on in Dallas, the Cowboys were a part of it. I think a lot of us craved the discipline that we had with Jimmy because we knew we had guys that you couldn't trust to be on their own. They were going to make mistakes. If you, didn't, if you didn't have somebody there that had a strong presence and instilled a little bit of fear in them, it just was a little bit too loose while Barry was there. There was scrutiny and there was criticism because... Uh, it was another opportunity to take a shot at uh, our team. The team was a media target, and every player became caught in their crosshairs. It was tabloid journalism, where every step and misstep was gleefully recorded. They were a front-page car crash, the paparazzi's dream team. Look good? One more. What's this for, anyway? Ironically, the team became the media. Many cowboys, including the long snapper, had radio or TV shows. Yeah, I was wanting to know about Dion's contract. How long is it? What are some of the terms? You got that all written down already? Well, I'm reading it right here off okay. your little cheat sheet. All right, uh, go ahead. Cowboys signed Sanders to seven-year, $35 million deal. I do basically the same things I've always done and basically what all head coaches do. And I spend half my time, instead of being on, on the walkthrough out there today, I'm in here talking to you guys, you understand? That's the role of a head coach. No matter what Jerry Jones does, somebody roasts him. If the Cowboys don't win the Super Bowl, Jerry Jones will be fried. Nationally, locally, in reality and, and in effigy, Jerry Jones will be hung by the Dallas Fort Worth media, certainly. There was not a week that the Cowboys could go without the press and just a free week. We were dealing with something every week of that season. And uh, it was just a very difficult time for us. And a lot of guys didn't know how to handle it. There were so many distractions over, the, over those times, uh, during that time. The only time that we were really happy was playing on Sundays. <laughs> Happiness came in week 12 when the Cowboys defeated the Raiders behind the playmaker, Michael Irvin, number 88. Michael Irvin, wide open. Touchdown, Cowboys. Oh, man, was he wide open. Irvin was the heart and soul of the 95 Cowboys. Big play! Oh, now, found 88! His combative spirit lifted him above the competition. Throws it in the end zone. Ball is caught. Michael Irvin. 111 catches and 1,600 yards were not the measure of this man. You get into those lulls during a season or a game, and he was the guy that could get you out of it. They starting to say, we can't run the damn football. They want to lie, stand made up in that same day. We'll run on Marty. We'll run on Let's go. damn day. All day. All day. All day. You found the 88. You found the 88. Hunt, Hunt. Hunt. Aikman on third and 13. Going for the bomb again for Michael Irvin in the corner of the oh, end zone. What a, he bobbled the ball. Oh, what a catch. Oh, man. Dale Carter was there. The ball was there, and Michael Irvin stayed with it. Wins over the Raiders and Chiefs gave Dallas a 9-2 and two record. To put those two wins back-to-back -back after the totally deflating experience with the 49ers uh, led people to believe we were on the right path. And it was like, little did they know that the December from hell was right around the corner. The 
The December from hell began on a heavenly Sunday. The Cowboys lost once again to the underdog Redskins. We had some fallout during that during that game at halftime. We, we there was a little fight that took place between Larry Larry Brown and Charles Haley after uh, uh, during the halftime of that game. Nothing got accomplished at halftime. We went right back back on the field and Redskins continued to stomp us. Touchdown, Washington Redskins. There was an unsettling feeling starting to permeate its way through the locker room. That what is our identity and and can we? you know, beat somebody we're supposed to beat. We just got to take care of business in December and get it done. I want to say the temperature was 19 and the wind chill in the vet was like seven below. And, and it, cold in Veteran Stadium is a different kind of cold. It's just, it's unmerciful. The Cowboys burst to a 17 to three lead. Throw the sideline, intercepted by Larry Brown. He may score 40. We felt that we had control of that game. I was able to go grab that ball and take it back, and we felt we had a nice cushion there. It was a game that we felt we shouldn't have lost and that we let slip away from us. Third and goal. Handoff to Waters. He's in. Touchdown. And the Eagles are back in this game. Late in the game, with the score tied at 17, the Cowboys took a risky gamble on fourth down. I remember Deion saying, you know, it wasn't fourth and a foot, it was fourth and a ding -a -ling. When you have the offensive line that we've had, and you had probably at that time, arguably the best back in the National Football League, if that line can't push forward for one yard, uh, then, then something's wrong there. Here's your ball game. Barry Switzer makes the call. Eagles could win it if they stop the Cowboys here. They give it to Smith. He doesn't make it. They stop him. The Eagles take over a third. The Eagles take over a third. The referees are talking. We've got some problems. We've got some problems. We lucked out. We got the snap off late. The two-minute warning goes off before the play. So it looks as though we've dodged a bullet. But no, we're going to go back and we're going to do it again. And not only are we going to do it again, we're going to run the exact same play. <laughs> Here we go, fourth down. They give it to Smith and they stop him again. And this time I can't take it away from the Eagles. The same play. And I can't believe Barry Switzer goes with the same play. Why would we call the same exact play? and run it right back in the teeth of that defense. We're in December, we're playing the worst football we've played all year. I mean, the media just, they crucified Barry. Barry takes a beating. Barry doesn't call the play. He just says, go for it. Uh, Barry says, uh, go for it again after the penalty. And the exact same play is called, but Barry takes the heat. He's the head coach. We felt like it's a 90% least chance of making it. and. Uh, we didn't make it, so that's a consequence of that. And uh, I'm Bozo the Clown, Bozo the Coach, and I have to live with that. So I'm the type of guy that can handle it. Everybody, including me, knows you're supposed to punt in that situation. I know you're supposed to punt. But there's times you believe in a football team and believe in the decision you've got to go win the ball game. We hadn't poured a drop the whole second half, hadn't scored a punt, hadn't done a damn thing. We're going to go try to get it done now. In mid-December, there was a sense of sincere worry I think throughout the, the, the locker room. Our psyche is gone a little bit now. We're not the most dominant team that, that we have been in the past. Something, something's going on here that we haven't had a taste of for a long time. We got on the plane to go to Arizona on Christmas Eve to go play a Monday night game in Arizona, last game of the year. And one team got on that plane and another team got off it. We knew before we got off the plane and the word spread through the plane through the rows of the plane like wildfire, 49ers lost. If we go into Arizona and we take care of business on Monday night, Christmas night against the Cardinals, we can get home field advantage again. The 37 to 13 win ended a roller coaster season. A wild stomach churning ride that saw them go from commanding to collapsing to champions of the East. Off Emmett Smith at the five, up to the three, to the one, touchdown Emmett Smith, hello record. The 25th rushing touchdown of the year for Emmett Smith. That game was just so special to us. Guys were excited, and I think it gave us the belief in ourselves again that we could do it, that we could make it back to the Super Bowl. Everything that happened back there from the injury to Kevin Smith to getting beat by the 49ers to the fourth and one disaster in Philadelphia, 
uh, the red skin losses, all that stuff, it's meaningless because guess what? We, we did what we set out to do when we were in training camp. So for the first time, there was kind of a positive vibe. But the vibe from Troy Aikman was that of a prisoner walking the last mile. Here comes the blitz. Anthony Davis sacks Troy Aikman. Looked like he might have hurt his knee or ankle. He's shaken up. He's going to go. Touchdown for the Lakers again. Davis looking left. Intercepted by Aeneas Williams. Touchdown, Arizona Cardinals. 1995 was less an odyssey than an ordeal for Aikman. There's all you media folks getting in the way. He was hounded by the press about his strained relationship with his head coach, a relationship that began under Switzer at Oklahoma. Aikman transformed the Sooners from a wishbone attack to a wide open offense. But when he was injured his sophomore year, Switzer helped him transfer to UCLA, where he starred and became the NFL's number one draft choice in 1989. While his relationship with Jimmy Johnson had been harmonious, it remained off-key with Barry Switzer. I sort of knew that there was a little rift between the two, between Switzer and Aikman. The lackadaisical style of coaching that Switzer uh, had, Troy was a perfectionist. He wanted to win games, and he wanted things to go exactly the way they went when Jimmy was there. Troy is a guy, all he wants to do is win championships. He wants everybody to do everything they possibly can. And, uh, you know, th th there were times when we felt that Barry, you know, needed to, to do more. Am I happy with my relationship with Aikman? As I've told you before, you know, I don't know if Chuck Noll had a great relationship with Terry Bradshaw or not. It wasn't important. He won four Super Bowls, right? That's the bottom line. I'm not going to drink RC Colas and double date and, you know, with him. We're not going to do those things. I mean, just it's not part of the game. It's not important. It's kind of like jockey itch. You can't ever get rid of the thing. You know, you, you keep talking. And everybody keeps bringing it up. And one of you have to answer it. You know, it rubs you raw. You know. <laughs> The most volatile situation erupted when assistant coach John Blake told Barry Switzer that Aikman was criticizing just the black players. Barry had called me in the office to talk about it. And what I told Barry was, hey, listen, you know, Troy is he's not that guy. And we don't look at Troy, I don't look at him personally as a guy that's a racist or if he's just yelling at black guys. I told him, listen, this that's what I expect out of Troy. And I went to Troy the same, that same day after walking out of Barry's office and telling Troy, hey, listen, we got your back. The guy that summarized it best for me was Charles Haley, and he said, look around that huddle. Most of the people that he hands the ball off to or that he interacts with in the offensive huddle are black. And it's his job to straighten them out if they step out of line. And if he doesn't do it, he's messing with my money, and I'll go in there and do it for him. He is a perfectionist. He is the ultimate competitor the most competitive person I've ever met. You didn't want to disappoint Troy. You don't want Troy mad at you. He had these physical gifts that were just God-given. The physical stature, he just looked like a quarterback. He looked like a statue to the game of football during the national anthem. When number eight went out into the huddle, you knew there was a top flight professional quarterback in there. He was just out there cutting people up, performing surgery. Aikman's discontent rarely surfaced, and his bottom line was still accuracy, efficiency, leadership, and guiding his team to championships. All quarterbacks follow the same path, but the great ones, like Troy Aikman, leave different footprints on the game. Cuts it up at the five. It's oh, oh, it's it's the it's the it's you knew his ultimate goal was to win games. That was his, that's what brought him happiness, perfect, being perfectionist and winning games. People who, who have that character trait where they're always looking for a way to improve or a way to get better and a way not to be satisfied generally have a positive impact on the whole organization doing well. Packers had become the Cowboys' whipping boys, and the lash was applied on a 99-yard drive before halftime. 
you just take the ball off the one and you go right down the field. Uh, there's nothing more demoralizing than that, especially at that critical part of the game. It was a vintage cowboy march. Powered by the triplets, it drained the clock and the Packers' will. Smith again, blocking again, and Emmett scores this time, and the Cowboys have taken the lead with the Emmett Smith touchdown with 24 seconds remaining in the first half. That drive coming off of our goal line was absolutely huge, and uh, you know it, it, it kind of is an indication of how, of how far we'd come in a month's time. Uh, you know, back in early December, I don't I don't know if we make that drive. One more goal, baby. Handoff, Emmett Smith at the 15. Oh, look at that hole. To the 10, he'll score. Emmett Smith dances to the end zone. The Steelers and the Cowboys in Arizona for Super Bowl 30. Oh, again. Oh, oh, going again. Oh, oh, oh. Y'all are tremendous, and, and I really appreciate some of the things that you guys said to me personally, some of you players in the ball game. It really means a lot to me. It really does. And I want to thank our coaching staff. I want to thank these guys that uh, all we have to put up with and all the people outside, hey, they're loyal, they stuck with me and fought their rear ends off, and so, I believe in them right. and they believe in me. The Cowboys look to win the Super Bowl for the third time in four years. For Barry Switzer, the former Oklahoma head coach, his ultimate moment seemed no bigger than a college bowl game. He kind of enjoyed just the circus atmosphere of it and didn't take it too seriously. And uh, I think for him, it was like a big bowl game. That's why we're at the Orange Bowl. That's why every, I mean, Orange Bowl, my God. <laughs> a big Orange Bowl. That's why we're at the big Orange Bowl. Barry didn't pay lip service to uh, uh, taking care of his kids and, and enjoying his family. And uh, he wanted them to, to enjoy this because he basically said to them, this is why I did this. This is why I put up with all this criticism. Max's wife's coming in, too. She told my daughter, she, my daughter called her and said, Mom, you want to go to the Super Bowl? And she says, well, I lived with that for 22 years. I, I said, I, I guess I can come to the Super Bowl. And I said, well, come on, I'll put a roll away in there for you. Hey, it's been a long time coming, but we finally here. Let's go out here for a complete game. Let's go from the Alpha to the Omega. Let's go out here, kick these Pittsburgh Steelers' ass up and down the field, and go home and enjoy it for four years. Hey! Let's go now, come on! Cowboys overpowering defense and picture-perfect offense overwhelmed the Steelers. Make the pass on first and goal from the three. Wide open, Dane Overcheck, touchdown! We've got control of the game. All of a sudden, there's a lull, and, and, and we don't have control of the game anymore. First and goal at the six. Slight pattern for the goal line. Touchdown, Steelers! I remember the Steelers scored right before halftime. And... It gave me a, a sick feeling in my stomach, and I went up on the roof of the press box. I was thinking, if, they, I, if I could get on that helicopter and get out of here, I would. And I'd go home and watch it on TV, because I don't know if I have the stomach to sit around and watch the rest of this one, because these guys think that they're in it, and we let them think that they're in it, and, and so they are. All of a sudden, they're back into it because we have a little bit of a lull during the course of the game, and then we got to hold on and, and have a little bit of luck help us out at the end. And uh, Larry Brown happened to be in the right place at the right time twice. My hands were so bad that, uh, as a rookie, he used to call me Edward Scissors hands. He couldn't catch anything at practice. Um, he had his biggest games against the best players on the biggest stages. It was just a zone play for us there, and I think uh, Neil O'Donnell, the ball got away from it, just slipped. He actually tried to hit a crossing route, 
uh, in my zone and ended up floating right to me. I said I was going to make sure I caught it, and uh, I think at that time I was trying to score, get up and down the sideline, and get that ball in the end zone if I could. And it was a freebie, it was a gift, and uh, gladly appreciate it. <laughs> Instead of burying the Steelers, they granted them a stay of execution. On the second interception, we were blitzing, and we were sending everybody. I think Neil recognized that it was a blitz check, and I beat the receiver to the spot. And again, I just tried to take it and get it in the end zone from there. 10, out of bounds, at the six-yard line. Hey, you get one more, you can run for mail. <laughs> I'll vote for you, dog. As long as you give me a job. <laughs> Second and goal from the four. Watkins in motion. Hand off Emmett Smith on the right hand side. Touchdown. Emmett Smith scores. And Dallas, your Cowboys are world champions again. Most valuable player at Super Bowl 30, Larry Brown. It was such a unique uh, bundle of, of personalities, unusual, unpredictable circumstances, and, and results that I don't know that, that another season will come along like that again and a team will wind up being on the platform with the trophy at the end. Victory was final vindication for Barry Switzer and his psychiatrist's dream of a team. Somehow they had survived this turbulent season and had won Super Bowl 30. I think that there was a collective sigh of relief mixed with a strong uh, sigh of euphoria. The joy just wasn't there, man. It was not the same. It was, thank God, the season's over. It was just a very, very strange year. A testimony to that team that we were able to get through all that and, and somehow find a way to win a championship. My position coach, Joe Brodsky, said it was one of the best performances he'd ever seen by a team. I asked him why, and he said because <laughs> he goes, you guys won in spite of the coaching. Cowboys would have made a great reality show. When you think about the characters and the type of people we had from Michael Irvin, Deion Sanders, to Barry Switzer as a head coach, to a unique owner and Mr. Jones. I think it was a relief off Jerry's shoulders to say, hey, listen, Barry Switzer sitting up here at this podium, not Jimmy Johnson, Barry Switzer, and he's the head coach of the Super Bowl champion Dallas Cowboys. For Barry especially, a dramatic weight had been lifted off his shoulders, and he just wanted to get up there and say, we did it. Are you having a good time now, Jerry? <laughs> I want to tell you, we did it our way, baby! We did it! We did it! We did it! For additional video content, photo galleries, and more from America's Game, visit NFL.com slash America's Game. <laughs> the nastiest band I've ever seen in my life. Hey, Y'all got some money for pornography? <laughs> Put a dog in me. Why do you use me as a piss boy? Um, you didn't show me no love. That's what it was. You didn't show me no love. Charles was a guy that would say anything to anyone at any time. What you want to do? You want a baby to take this home and show your wife and say, this is what my body should look like? This is what a warrior look like? Charles is one of those guys that you have to stand up to the first time you meet him. And if you don't stand up to him, he's he's going to make life miserable for you. Don't go to neither side. I go in the middle of the damn field. Get down on both knees and Lord help me, please. Just because your head's shaped like a bullet don't make you a big shot there, boy. <laughs> you couldn't let Charles get the upper hand on you. Because once he knew he had the upper hand on you, you were done. I put y'all working the hell out my damn face, right? <laughs> At his best, he is uh, loving and caring and sensitive. This is, my, this is the mean one right here. This is CJ, Charles Jr. At his worst, he's temperamental. He's irritating. He's caustic. You, you the one who grabbed me around my waist, hey, I man. I ain't hey, the woman no fight. you love me, man. He's uh, sarcastic. He's thinks he's funnier than he is. Look at, it, look at Pork of the Pig right here. <laughs> Even get on the other side of him. Even get on the other side of him. Some days you could not pay him 
to shut up. Other days, you couldn't get him to talk. When he showed up on that field, I, I've never seen a warrior more fierce, more committed to winning, wanting to lay it out there every down than this guy, Charles Haley. Charles Haley, a demon both on the field and off it, was the final piece in the Cowboys championship puzzle. We couldn't spell Super Bowl in Dallas until we got Charles Haley from the 49ers. Uh, he, was, he was the key piece to the puzzle. I think the best description I ever heard of Emmett's running style was like a, uh, someone wrote that he, he skittered across the field like a hot dog wrapper in the wind, just stopping and then going a little bit more and then stopping and then moving laterally and eventually working his way down the field. Fullback Daryl Johnston was Smith's most valuable teammate. This bowling ball in cleats rarely carried the ball, but when he did, he adhered to the old maxim that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. With number 48, harsh contact was inevitable. Johnston's teammates valued this good soldier, who provided the armed escort for all of Emmett Smith's sensational runs. Hand off, Emmett Smith, up the middle, running, 25, 30, one tackle to break, he does, 25, 20, straight to the end zone, to the 10, to the 5, touchdown, Cowboys! Absolutely, incredibly strong run by Emmett Smith. Let's go East! He had uh, a great sense of inner pride and wanted to be something more than just a good player. He wanted to leave footprints on the game. You wanted to play with Michael. You wanted to go to war with Michael. Every play, baby, every play, do it. His personality was um, magnetic, electric, uh, charismatic. It's hard to capsulize Michael Irvin's personality other than to say that he had more of it in his little finger than probably 98% of the population do in their whole body. He was the personality, the charisma. Max, I gotta go deep on him, Max. I gotta go deep. I gotta back the ass up. And I think when you have a player like that who really genuinely cares about everybody on that team and how they play. Michael wanted that and he enjoyed it when you had success. That's what made Michael Irving a tremendous leader. Without a doubt, the hardest working guy on that team through that era. Nobody, nobody's even close. He, he was a machine. It was two o'clock in the afternoon, man, probably close to 100 degrees in Dallas. Brutal in July. He runs around, he throws up, he sits there for a while, sprays out his mouth, he gets back on that line, he ran about 10, 15 more routes, one after the other, man. The work, his work ethic was, you couldn't match it. You know, he always said he goes hard on, on both ends. He's gonna go hard at practice, he's gonna go hard in life. I remember Michael Irvin at training camp going out partying all night long, walking in and getting ready to go to practice the next day. That was him. I mean, he, he, did, he only needed to work off maybe a couple hours of sleep, if that. That was him, he just, he just burned it on both ends. He apologized a number of times about his issues off the field. I remember one meeting going in and uh, having a team meeting, and after the team meeting, the coaches, coaches left, and he, he broke down crying, talking about how he apologized for all, all the things that, uh, all the problems he may have caused for that team, and uh, that he'll work 110 times even uh, harder on that practice field, practice field to show us that uh, he's intent on winning a championship, and, you know, that was him. He was, he was an emotional person.
For Larry Brown, football took a backseat to tragedy in 1995. My wife at the time had uh, actually had a baby and, and we were born premature. And Father, I do pray for Christopher Brown, just like Russell did. I pray that you would preserve him and strengthen him. Give uh, Cheryl and Larry great endurance as they watch him in the hospital and spend time with him. And Father, may he be raised to his full health. There's not, there's not enough words. There's not good enough words to describe what the feeling, feeling he was going through. Not only himself, but you know his wife and his family and and his family that was with the Cowboys. For the whole season, we knew that, you know, there was complications here and there and things I had to deal with there. But that week was tough because he actually had passed that week and we had to bury him. He had the, the funeral the day we were leaving uh, for a game. And uh, that was on a Saturday. And uh, we left out on a, on a away game uh, right after the funeral. Mr. Jones left his plane for me. He said, if you want to come, it's up to you. If you don't, uh, we understand. And I talked to my family about it, and I prayed about it, and, and made this, uh, the commitment to go ahead and, and show up to the game. And I think the most moving thing of it is uh, my son's name was uh, Christopher Brown. When I got to the game, every all the players had KB on their helmet, and I wanted to play. I wanted to play for myself. I wanted to play for my son. And uh, it was one of the hardest things I ever had to do. The Raiders game uh, was highlighted by, I think, my all-time favorite Dion interception. He, he was covering Rocket. Ismail down the field, the center of the field, and Dion went up and reached over the rocket, snatched the ball with, with two hands, and then held the ball up in the air, and it was just like, wow. Darren Woodson maintained the cowboy tradition of great safeties who possessed game-changing abilities. Darren Woodson on a big time interception return of 37 yards. I think we became more focused going in to that playoff run. Now, were we the same team? Were we as dominant as a team and, and as athletic and as talented? No, we weren't, but we were a team that was focused on winning that game. The fourth and one fiasco in Philly seemed ancient history when Darren Woodson knocked quarterback Rodney Pete out of the game. He ran out of the bottom of the pocket, trying to get the first down, and uh, I just tried to brace myself, and he ran, he didn't see me. At the time, I was just trying to destroy him. Cowboy fans saw why Deion Sanders was called prime time. Here's a reverse to Deion Sanders. Cuts up field at the 25. Now reverses direction. Finds a blocker. At Touchdown. the 20. Touchdown. To the right. To the 10. To the 5. Touchdown, oh, Sanders. You just shook your head and were like, that's that's unbelievable. Yeah, and I remember all that anybody was concerned about was not was he going to get in the end zone, but what type of dance he would do when he finally did. Here he goes. Here he goes. Temple in the end zone. Here we go, Don. A mood look, Don. Good, Don. It was vintage 1966. Someone called the Dallas Cowboys the now team of the mod times. And Don Meredith was to be the leading man of pro football's new age. Merlin Olson once said that Meredith has a charisma. That's exactly what he's got. Uh, you don't know why, but he, you just consider him exceptional. I don't think I've ever come across anybody in athletics that was at, as good at being a leader. Wing zig out. We're cutting them. I'll tell you what, let's just group together. Everything's going all right. We're just making some mistakes, and those things, we'll get them over with. We're going to whip them. We're going to whip them. He always had his finger on the pulse of the team, and, and everybody, from, from the offense to the defense, to the, the star player, to the last guy on the bench. He cared about everybody. And I, I, I believe part of it was cunning. You know, part of it was just pure, sheer animal cunning, knowing that a team didn't win unless you did that. Meredith had been with the winless expansion Cowboys in 1960. By 66, he had them on a dizzying climb up the standings. From 1966 through 1968, the Dallas Cowboys gained more yards and scored more points than any other team in the NFL. 
Number 22, Bob Hayes, the world's fastest human, made the Cowboys the world's fastest football team. Head coach Tom Landry's multiple formation offense revolutionized pro football, forsaking three yards in the cloud of dust for big plays in a burst of smoke. On defense, Landry's flex was equally ahead of its time. It, too, was the fastest unit in the league and ranked first against the run in 66, 67, and 68. The Cowboys had the muscle and the head. It would be up to Meredith to supply the heart. We were playing the Redskins, and uh, Don was beaten up worse that day than I think I've ever seen any athlete take punishment like this in one game. One of his ribs broke, punctured a lung, and while we're in the game, I remember coming back towards the huddle, and he's just lying down there, and I said, Don, Jesus, you know, somebody is calling somebody to come carry him off the field. And he just looked up at me, he said, just get me to my feet. The Cowboys trailed 30 to 28, but Meredith rose off the canvas and showed his teammates how to rise to the occasion. And we were down with just 90 seconds to go in the game, and we had 99 yards to go. The team should have been down uh, mentally and ready to give up. Meredith came out, stepped into the huddle, and he smiled, and he says, OK, boys, we're going to run and pass this ball down the field and win this game. All right, now I want you to listen to me and listen good, because this is what we're going to do. We're going to run the ball, we're going to pass the ball, we're going right down this field, and we're going to score. The most intense experience I ever had. And I stepped back out of the huddle, and I took off my helmet, and I looked up. And he was so focused, you know, and I looked up, suddenly, I, I was losing focus. I saw the crowd, and I could feel it was like I was being lifted out of the field and up into the air. I mean, I can, I can feel that now when I get goosebumps when I think about it. And we systematically marched down the field. Everybody in that offensive huddle knew that we were going to score, and nothing Washington did or could do was going to stop the Dallas Cowboys. It was the fall of 1966, and the Cowboys had climbed to the threshold of greatness. Only one team stood in their way. It was a clash not so much of teams, but of times. Tradition versus innovation. Destiny versus dynasty. The invincible image of Lombardi's Packers was taking a beating. Twice, Green Bay built leads of 14 points. Once, the Cowboys came back to tie. And the second time, the Cowboys cut it to seven on Meredith's 68-yard touchdown to Frank Clark. With under two minutes to go, the dynasty was in danger. And the Cowboys had their destiny and the ball at the two-yard line. An offsides penalty cost them five yards. Then, running back Dan Reeves tried to see the way to victory. And I actually went in the line and I got hit uh, in the eye by Ron Kostelnik. And I, I probably should have come out of the ball game, uh, you know, looking back on it. But I had kind of a blurry vision or a double vision. And the next play, uh, you know, as he laid it off to me, I should have caught it because I had two chances. I saw two balls, but I, you know, I didn't catch the ball. All right. 93 T pull, all set. Ready? On third down, Meredith had tight end Pettis Norman open at the goal line, but underthrew him. Norman caught it at the two. That brought fourth down, and history hung on the execution of a single play. What happened was that Coach Landry sent in a play uh, that was designed to go uh, be run when Frank Clark and myself were in the game. And unfortunately, Bob Page were in the game, was in the game at that time, and he didn't know how to run that play. Now, it's important for Frank Clark, who comes in always on goal line at the split end, to block Robinson. 
the linebacker so he doesn't penetrate upfield. If he penetrates upfield, then you can't get your guard out in front of you and then your rollout chances are gone. Hayes has never played on the goal line. He doesn't know what the play is. He's never practiced it. So Hayes doesn't make the block. He just shoots between the linebacker and the tackle and goes out into the corner. Robinson's upfield too fast. He grabs Meredith. Meredith, just since it's fourth down, he just throws the ball away. And... The analysis of the game is Meredith throws an interception, which was not what happened at all. That was not what happened at all. It was a, it was a horrible thing to see happen. One year later, the Cowboys again faced the Packers for the NFL championship. This time, it was the chilling championship, the Ice Bowl, the most famous game in NFL history. But this time, the Cowboys had the lead, 17 to 14, and the Packers had to travel 68 yards in the game's final five frozen minutes. I remember the, a sinking feeling in my stomach that I'd never experienced before. Uh, watching that game from the sideline, um, it was like a horror story being played out. And I was part of it, and it was real. And I was being chased by the monster. The Packers took their final time out at the one. Again, the Cowboys would need just one play to topple the king and become one themselves. Here are the Packers, third down, inches to go. Debater, 17 to 14, Cowboys out in front. Packers trying for the go-ahead score. Starr takes the snap. He's got the quarterback sneak and he's into the touchdown. The Packers are out in front. And the Green Bay Packers are going to be world champions. I got to tell you, I've never seen a loss take the heart out of a team like that loss took, took it out of the Dallas Cowboys. When the heart was gone, the soul was soon to follow. After a playoff loss to the Cleveland Browns the next year, Don Meredith retired at the age of 31. We went into this restaurant and somebody noticed Don and I and they started booing him. And the people sat there in this restaurant and stood up and booed him until we left. Oh, it hurts to get booed. The most disappointing thing is that in your heart, you know you did the best you could. You know you did the very best that you could. And then they just say, whammo. You know, they just like, they really let you have it. And you want to say, hey, you know, but you really don't understand, people. You don't really understand what it's all about. And just because they didn't win at all, the greatness of Meredith's Cowboys may never be understood.